talking again about bone then. No, um, <laughs> so um, I, I, I would like to, uh, well, thank you for having me first. Uh, and I would like to, to sort of talk about three, uh, three topics a little bit, uh, motivated by the question, uh, wh why, why is it so important to have a synchrotron uh, to, to study this? So the first point is uh, for inoperando, in situ, or whatever kind of studies. So let's say a few words about this. The second uh, is uh, embedding um, imaging with synchrotron into imaging with many other uh, uh, techniques uh, to get a multi method correlative imaging. And there I'd like to talk a little bit about our, our recent work on the osteocyte network. And then uh, I'll uh, make a point about 3D imaging. And I have a list of some people, mostly from the Institute. I uh, should also add uh, the uh, ASRF collaborators and many others, I think, at this point. So uh, just to remind you uh, uh, very quickly uh, what, uh, what bone is. Uh, and why uh, it's interesting to, to have a synchrotron radiation to look at it. So bone is of course uh, structured over many length scales and at the lowest length scale down here, uh, we are in the nanometer scale uh, where we have uh, mineral particles, just a few nanometers in size embedded in some uh, more or less complex ways uh, into a protein matrix, uh, which is then assembled into fibers, into lamellae and into higher order structures. And I think from a medical or biological viewpoint, it is absolutely important if we look at the nanoscale to keep uh, the specimens intact at the micro scale, otherwise we lose the context. And I think this is uh, a strong motivation, obviously, uh, for using uh, methods like synchrotron. Now, at the end of the morning, we talked about resolution and I, I like to show that slide just to say that no matter how good we make beam lines, um, uh, we, they cannot serve everything, even if they are perfect. And the reason is totally trivial. Um, so I, when I showed earlier the mineral particles and the collagen molecules in the nanometer scale, the fibrils are in the 100 nanometer scales, bone lamellae are in the few micron scale, <clears throat> bone trabeculae and osteons are, let's say in the 100 micron scale, the thickness of the cortex is in the millimeter scale and the whole bone is in centimeter, decimeter, almost meter scale. And if you just take uh, 1D, uh, uh, this makes eight orders of magnitude. But if you want to get 3D, uh, this makes 24 orders of magnitude. So that's uh, more than molecules in a liter of gas. So nobody wants to deal with as many voxels as this. There's no way. So no matter what we do, I mean, this is totally trivial uh, statement. Uh, we have to choose uh, what we need, which ranges uh, of, uh, of those, whether we need higher resolution or a better field of view. And I did not mention the fourth dimension, which is time or some other parameter that we change as a function of time. So this is going to be a little bit of a guideline. And of course, the consequence is that, and this is just a small selection of techniques, that there is a wide range of techniques available today uh, to look at structures, uh, some of them uh, based on, on light, some of them based on, on X-ray tomography, scattering diffraction, on spectroscopy, uh, and uh, even all the way down to the atom probe tomography where you have a, a really atomic resolution in 3D. So, uh, if we think about uh, using synchrotron, I think it is uh, important to keep all the rest also in mind. So I said, I, I would uh, uh, briefly cover uh, three, three uh, topics just to give you an impression of, of what the needs are. So the first topic will be, uh, will be in situ in operando studies. And here I'm starting with collagen and then uh, we will move into bone briefly. So the idea here is we would like to understand the effect of osmotic pressure, dehydration osmotic pressure on uh, collagen based tissues. And uh, so for this, of course, we need sp specimen environment that uh, uh, allows to control humidity, that allows to control force uh, on, on, on the fiber. Uh, and then we want to have a small and wide angle scattering simultaneously and maybe we also want some spectroscopic information at the same time. So some uh, five years ago where this paper was published, 
uh, so here is the one of the interesting uh, observations. So the first maybe uh, that these um, um, diffraction scattering patterns from collagen, they are remarkably rich. I mean, the, you, you see the face expression changing from, uh, from zero stress uh, uh, dry to uh, completely wet or uh, isostrain dry to completely wet, you see there's a lot of changes in various of these peaks. And of course, these peaks, they give us information on many length scales. So for example, on the helix pitch uh, of, uh, of, the, of the collagen, which is uh, this red cross here, on the, on the packing of the collagen fibril, which are the peaks in the center, this is the longitudinal packing, the lateral packing, the distance between collagen molecules in the direction perpendicular to the fiber direction are these broad peaks here, etc. So these can all be measured simultaneously. And uh, I think I don't want to go too much into details, but first of all, uh, if you dehydrate, all these uh, distances change, and importantly, they do not change uh, in the same way. So drying does not affect the molecule in the same way as it affects uh, the fibril or uh, the whole tissue. And what's even more uh, important, if we prevent uh, shrinkage by, so that's the isostrain case where we just uh, keep the length of the fiber constant, you see an enormous force development. Well, uh, maybe you don't see it as enormous immediately if you see that this is a unit of piconewtons. So let me show you. So this is piconewton per molecule. So let me show you in, in another uh, set of units. So horizontally, we have the, the relative humidity in a dehydration experiment or the corresponding osmotic pressure. And here is now the stress in megapascal. And uh, if you completely dehydrate collagen, you get uh, 100 megapascal stress. So that's sufficient to break uh, rocks uh, and bones. So it's, it's, it's a fantastically uh, big um, force uh, stress that develops. And even uh, now you will say, well, uh, there's nothing physiological about dehydrating uh, collagen. But uh, if you now uh, stay in the range of an osmotic pressure, which is a kind of dehydration through a chemical means, and we take the osmotic pressure that we have in cartilage in our knee, which is about 400 kilopascal. So we are here in the very beginning of that curve. Then the contractile stress in collagen will be 250 as compared to the peak stress in muscle, which is 300 kilopascal. So collagen uh, generates higher force than muscle uh, with an osmotic stress uh, corresponding to cartilage. So there's something uh, non-negligible here. And now forgetting, uh, uh, so this is work by, uh, together with Luca Bertinetti, who is now in, in Dresden mostly and, and others, um, if, if instead of dehydrating, which is, as I said, non-physiological, you just put a, a piece of mineralized collagen, a piece of bone or mineralized turkey leg tendon, something like this, uh, into uh, uh, a solution that contains uh, polyethylene glycol, means an osmolite. Now, everything is fully hydrated. We're just applying osmotic pressure. And you have these red, blue, red, blue bars is uh, here we have the osmolite, then we wash away, we have the osmolite, we wash away, you see that you get a uh, megapascal range contractile force uh, just by uh, putting osmolites uh, into fluid because collagen contracts. And uh, the last uh, comment I'd, I'd like to make here, so we, we are trying now to sort of uh, try to unravel uh, whether what meaning this may have uh, uh, in, in biology. And so uh, one thing that's still unpublished, and you see Luca is here, an important author, and uh, Manu Schneck, who is now in Darmstadt, and some others, Roland Netz is a, is a molecular dynamics person in Berlin. So we, here we're looking at, uh, at actually polypeptide constructs uh, that uh, also crystallize like a collagen would, they also triple helical as uh, collagen would be. And it's very interesting to see that uh, the dependence of uh, the helix pitch, which is uh, the vertical axis here on the relative humidity or the osmotic pressure that you have here on top, uh, depends a lot on the actual amino acid sequence. 
And what is most surprising that the canonical sequence in collagen, which is proline, hydroxypolyne, glycine, actually expands when you dehydrate it. So everything is uh, dependent on the amino acid sequence. And it seems that native collagen uh, is actually evolved in such a way that it has the right, uh, um, the right sequence in the right places to lead to uh, substantial contraction. I think that's very interesting. We are not at the end of understanding this, but I think it's important uh, indication that here we have to look really into the details of the interaction of uh, amino acids with water. But again, uh, just to give you the, uh, the, the, the magnitude of the effect again. So this is another uh, paper uh, with uh, Luca. Uh, if you take, uh, for example, uh, turkey leg tendon, which is either unmineralized uh, here on the right or fully mineralized or has an intermediate mineralization. So the mineral content varies because this tendon does not fully mineralize everywhere. And now we just dehydrate it. And uh, now we can use uh, in an in situ diffraction experiment, we can use the mineral particles as stress sensors because a mineral is uh, uh, just a ceramic a piece uh, of hydroxyapatite. And uh, you see the peak shift here of the 002 peak uh, with uh, between wet and dry. And if you convert this with the known uh, elastic modulus of hydroxyapatite, you can get mineral, uh, you can get pressures, compressive stresses on the mineral in the order of the gigapascal. This is absolutely huge. And uh, what it means is that uh, the, the, the collagen that is uh, attached to the surface of the mineral, when it contracts, it compresses the mineral. And this compression is not just obtained uh, through uh, dehydration, uh, and now I'm showing you uh, work with Paul Zaslansky uh, and others. But uh, it is actually there in uh, totally uh, native bone as well. So how, do you, how, do you can, how can you prove this? Well, the easiest way of proving this is you're measuring uh, the lattice constant of your ceramic uh, in bone, uh, then uh, you... Uh, sort of deproteinate uh, the bone, maybe just by, de, uh, not by denaturation of the proteins by going to high temperatures, you go back to room temperature, you measure again, and then you, you find out uh, that uh, the mineral particles have uh, relaxed and changed their lattice spacing. And uh, in a normal, either dentin or bone, dent, this is dentin, this is bone, uh, the compressive pre-stress on mineral is in the order of 50 to 100 megapascal. So this is about the fracture st uh, stress of, of mineral in the other direction. So you're doubling the range uh, of tensile forces that the, the uh, tissue can uh, withstand just by pre-compressing the mineral through the collagen. So I think this is probably an interesting property of collagen uh, that we need to understand better. So here uh, were my examples uh, of uh, uh, using uh, in situ approaches. And I think we need uh, a lot of those, not just uh, humidity and temperature, but uh, uh, many, many others as well. So my second uh, point uh, is uh, multimodal imaging, where uh, we want to combine or we are combining and many others to uh, synchrotron based imaging with uh, other imaging. So. This, this is backscattered uh, uh, electron imaging of a specimen. And the same uh, specimen can actually be used uh, to map, uh, for example, mineral uh, orientation distribution in these osteons. It is measured on the same specimen or on some of these pieces here, Raman imaging that gives us some information on the chemistry or mechanical imaging that gives us some impression on the mechanics. And this all can be done in sub-micron resolution. It's very nice uh, that we are there. And I think the sub-micron resolution, if we speak about resolution, is at least for these types of tissues, the most interesting range, because it is small, small enough compared to most of these features and still big enough to give us some average to have a good uh, statistical description of the nanoscale parameters, such as particle size and orientation and so on. So for this uh, uh, 
already 2005, we, we, we created our own beamline at, uh, at, at BASI to exactly do this. But uh, there we don't have the sub-micron resolution, just, just 10 microns. And of course, for higher resolution, uh, we need, uh, for example, uh, the SRF and ID13, of course, is, is one of the best for this. Um, one side remark, uh, software development is, is crucial for this uh, big uh, data. And, and I think everybody's aware of this. Um, and there are big programs uh, in, in all the synchrotron centers, but I couldn't uh, uh, emphasize more. I think the bottleneck is slowly shifting from photons uh, to electrons, I mean, in, in the calculation, yeah? So we have to be, we have to be absolutely, we, we, we should not waste any photon, that's my point. So, so this is something that uh, I'm, I'm arguing is, is, is very, very important. Okay, so let me, let me come to the example of what moves us very much now in this area of, uh, of uh, uh, 2D imaging at the moment, 2D slash 3D imaging. Uh, we would like to understand the role of the osteocyte network in bone. So I'm not sure if all of you know what, uh, what that exactly is. So this uh, is um, a, an image from confocal light microscopy, actually, where these... Uh, sort of yellowish elongated things are cells or actually cavities where cells are sitting. Uh, these cells are called uh, osteocytes and all these uh, fiber-like structures are little tunnels that connect all these cells. And if you look, uh, I mean, at, at a piece of bone, if you take a chicken bone, uh, look at the cortex next time you, you, you have chicken, you will not see with your eyes that there's this porosity uh, because it's really too small. These channels are just 300 nanometers in diameter and the cells are just uh, a few microns in size. But uh, what is really amazing is that every single voxel within compact bone is not much further away than about a micron from the next cell or cell process, one micron. So these cells are literally everywhere. And here, this is uh, ESRF uh, data combined with light microscopy. So, so this uh, is interesting, and I'm showing this because it combines two entirely different image modalities. So here on the left uh, image, we have a confocal light microscopy after rhodamine staining, where we can see in black uh, the cells, and in, uh, also in black, uh, we have this, uh, these connections, the cell processes, or actually the canaliculi that house these processes. And the color map is just uh, a map uh, that maps the distance of that particular pixel to the next cell process. So in this yellow part here, it's rather far away to find a cell or a cell process, while in these blue areas, they are very, very close together. And here on the right side, it's the exact same specimen that was measured uh, uh, and scanned with a, with a micron resolution to measure uh, the mineral particle size thickness through small angle scattering. And the color scale here is the size of the particles. And down here, we are correlating the two. And you see that we have a very strong uh, a correlation between a parameter size and distance to the network. And uh, for example, uh, where the distance to the network is larger, uh, at least in these specimens, the, the uh, part, uh, mineral particles are smaller. And that uh, kind of information will help us, uh, hopefully, to understand uh, even better the function of this network. This network has many functions. One is the transport of mineral precursors, most likely. Another one is mechanosensing. And so uh, this, again, is this uh, 3D imaging of the network. And uh, what was shown in this rather recent paper by Alex Van Tol is that when uh, you image the network and you calculate the fluid flow uh, that occurs because you're walking uh, every day, hopefully still uh, with the confinement. So if you're walking, you put some pressure on your bones, putting pressure on your bones, uh, you inside the fluid that's inside to flow inside these channels. And the speed at which they flow have to do with the network architecture and the diameter of the channels. If you calculate this, where the, flu where the fluid flow is largest, you see that you have the fastest bone up position. So somehow 
these networks seems to uh, correlate uh, with the bone opposition. And the other uh, interesting aspect, uh, and one other interesting aspect shown on the right side here, there's another very recent paper uh, that comes really from a clinical, uh, from a biological research project where, uh, so where people actually introduce a human bone uh, into mice. I mean, it's a little, for a physicist like me, a little frightening. So these are chimeric animals. But of course, they, uh, they are used to study uh, the, uh, the response of uh, human uh, cells then to drugs in a non-human model. And we were just interested uh, to look at some of the bones that these people have. And uh, it's very interesting to realize that uh, human tissue and mouse tissue seamlessly integrate uh, as far as the network goes. Yeah, So these cells communicate with each other, although this part here is, uh, is purely mouse and this part is purely human. They have slightly different structure, but these things uh, communicate. So all this can be seen. And the last, uh, a bit more extensive example, um, this is a measurement uh, from uh, uh, from ESRF, and this is mostly Wolfgang Wagermeyer in his group. Uh, so there, uh, the question is, how does this uh, network re-establish after a bone fracture occurs? So I think we need this network for mechanosensing, but then now you have separated your two pieces of bone. How does it re-establish? How it, does it reconnect? Uh, I mean, that seems very interesting. I mean, if you if you cut uh, neurons, it's very hard to have them reconnected, but here you're cutting another very complex sensory system. How does it actually reconnect? And so this is a combination of uh, uh, either backscatter imaging, you could also do micro CT instead, uh, if you wanna have it 3D, confocal uh, laser scanning microscopy to image the network. Um, this is much more efficient than micro CT because we get a better large, much more easily a large field of view and then high resolution, small and wide angle scattering. And this is the kind of tissue here, the two pieces of bone that are broken. This is the callous tissue that forms in response to the fracture. And I'm not going to go into details because of lack of time, but it's, it, it is kind of fantastic that you can collect uh, the size of the particles. This is an image with rather high resolution uh, uh, that uh, in a color code shows you the size of the particles, big particles in the remaining cortex, much smaller ones in the newly formed uh, callus. Uh, rho is a parameter that shows you the alignment of the particles that's high in the cortex and low here. This is from diffraction, uh, the, the peak width of the 002 from hydroxyapatite that gives you some measure on the length of these particles. The lattice constant, uh, which uh, probably is not strain, but I, I suppose uh, linked to um, maybe impurities in the, in the hydroxyapatite, although we don't know for sure yet. So all this is mapped uh, at SRF and then is combined here as you can see with uh, the network that develops and we know now uh, what are the tissue characteristics in the places where the network is developing and so on. And one thing, I mean, we, th this is not fully, uh, fully finished this kind of research, but I think one thing is clear is that uh, the tissue architecture and the network architecture, they are very strongly correlated. And the reason is not very surprising because the tissue and then it's made by the cells that actually constitute the network because the cells are the ones that synthesize everything. So this is, a, 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 I think, an, an interesting multi-method approach where a synchrotron is integrated with uh, other uh, methods. So I think uh, time is flying. So let me come to, to the last bit that's going to be a little, uh, a little shorter. Uh, I think there's a lot of future. I mean, you have heard about small angle scattering. There's a lot of future for three-dimensional uh, ap approaches to small angle scattering. Uh, and uh, I just copied here the, the two uh, seminal papers that uh, got this, uh, this thing started really five years ago. And I mean, the, the challenge here is really that uh, unlike normal X-ray tomography, where you can rotate around uh, one axis, because you're reconstructing a, a scalar quantity, which is, uh, which is the logarithm uh, of the transmission. Uh, in sex tomography, you, you have to reconstruct the tensor. And so 
uh, you need to rotate around many axes. And the consequence is lots of beam time, lots of reconstruction time. And I think that there needs to be some way of uh, reducing the, uh, the, the load in terms of beam time and reconstruction time if this is going to be uh, of any clinical importance. I mean, where we have to measure cases, controls, many specimens and so on. Um, so let me get this running. So this is not, uh, not uh, X-ray based. This is a focused ion beam uh, uh, scanning electromicroscopy. And uh, what I just want to show is that uh, these, these are collagen fibrils uh, and uh, mineral is entering into them. And you can see these bright spots. These are it's all mineral. You can see how the mineral is entering the fibrils. And the point I want to make here, this is of course a formation site, uh, but the point I want to make is that the fibril is by no means necessarily fully mineralized. It's, it's many of them have, have half filled with mineral. And, uh, and so there's a lot of uh, heterogeneity in this tissue. And uh, this again is unpublished. This is TEM from Elena uh, Marcia Sanchez. She's now in, uh, Nico Sommerdijk's group in, uh, in Nijmegen. And this is one fibril. And again, you can see the fibrils in this TM, actually, especially in this chemical map, you see the nitrogen map, that's a protein. This is calcium that corresponds to the TM picture. And of course the calcium cor is correlates with phosphorus and oxygen. And you see this fibril here, that's this one uh, is sort of being infiltrated with more or less, but not really parallel plates uh, that we see edge on. And here you, they are sort of aligned, but not really. Uh, and that is very much in line with a number of other papers uh, by Shu et al, now from the Somatag group, just published also what people call lacy patterns by Resnikov and Schwartz. So my last few slides here, and uh, I know that uh, Tillman is going to speak about tensor tomography later, so I'll, I'll not say much, but symmetries are very useful. And one symmetry is that uh, the SAC signal from a plate is essentially uh, linear uh, perpendicular to the plate. For a thin fiber, it's the opposite. It's, uh, it's circular around the fiber. But the problem we're having in bone is, well, we have plates and fibers. So if you look at plates, then uh, they are aligned in all kinds of ways. If they would be randomly oriented within a thin fiber, you would be referred to a fiber uh, sort of situation. But uh, the reality is unfortunately more complex so that uh, one fiber is not rotationally symmetric. And uh, I'm, uh, we'll probably hear how to deal with all this later. So our approach that we are sort of trying to, to, to think about uh, to make, to save as much as possible calculation time is to uh, use uh, the fact that we have platelets and then uh, integrate the signal around the rotation axis. And then instead of reconstructing the whole tensor, we reconstruct uh, um, scalar quantities, namely, some of the SACS invariants, the porot constant, the integral intensity. So these are just scalars. And so the details are in this uh, paper here. And these scalars, they can be reconstructed by normal micro CT uh, uh, approaches because they are scalars. Okay. So uh, to conclude, uh, uh, to leave a few minutes for discussion, uh, I, I, I think I, wanted to emphasize this dilemma between resolution and field of view, but uh, Sigurdsson offers many possibilities, very high resolution uh, in, in terms of diffraction and, and scattering up there, combined with uh, uh, sort of imaging, uh, mostly tomographic or, uh, or scanning imaging in the, in the micrometer range uh, around here. And this is uh, this is pretty pretty unique in this uh, in this uh, setting. Um, what I think is very important uh, uh, is this um, integration with other techniques, and that leads a lot of thinking about specimen preparation and specimen uh, characteristics, so that they would be able to enter different <coughs> instruments. Um, Multi scale and of course uh, in situ in operando operando capabilities exploiting the, the time uh, axis. Okay, so 
this uh, concludes my my little presentation and thank you very much for listening yes uh, peter thank you very much for this very impressive and comprehensive presentation and i'm sure we will get some questions <laughs>